Well, my advice will start from what we realized in Ukraine at some point. We realized that there's a huge blockchain community. There are a lot of people that are using crypto and you can't ignore it. So if you are truly the of your country, take care of your people, want to take care of people, make it official. Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is how to get started, how to get better, how to front run the opportunity. This is Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. Guys, we have a special guest on the show today, the Deputy Minister of Digital Transformation of Ukraine, Alex Bornyakov. We are talking to Alex all about what's going on in Ukraine. A few things that we discuss. Number one, how crypto is helping Ukraine in a time of war. Number two, why Ukraine's government is adopting a crypto-friendly policy as a result of this. And number three, his advice for other countries considering crypto policy. We're talking to someone who is in an active uh, conflict zone, an active war zone. Of course, uh, we've never done this before on Bankless, but crypto has become very relevant, actually, to the story of Ukraine. And I think is an example of the, the type of impact that this technology can have on the world. David, we uh, got introduced in, in kind of an interesting way to, uh, to Alex. Could you uh, talk about that introduction? Yeah, we got introduced to Alex via Vitalik Buterin. Uh, Vitalik and, and I were passing messages in Telegram about who best to bring on from Ukraine to tell the story about crypto in Ukraine. Uh, and we landed on the, the deputy minister of digital transformation himself, who uh, Vitalik was in contact with previously. So Vitalik introduced us and uh, we just immediately hit it off in, in telegrams to schedule a, a quick podcast just to get the story out the door. So this is an official representative out of the, the Ukrainian government telling the story about how crypto has moved the needle in Ukraine. Uh, so. Uh, an unscheduled podcast, but you know, when, when Vitalik Buterin connects you with somebody straight from the Ukrainian government, uh, you make a podcast. Uh, yeah. So that, that is what we did. Um, and it, it, he helps really tell the story of the details of what it's like as a government to use crypto funds to make things happen quickly and meaningfully when it comes time to saving lives. Uh, and so th there's, uh, there's a lot, a lot of, um, previous ideology and, and uh, philosophy and uh, ideation about how crypto can help the world. But uh, every once in a while, the world presents you with an actual story to, to really illustrate like this is what when when things get real, uh, crypto is there. Uh, and so Alex is here to help us tell that story of how things got real in Ukraine and how crypto was there for the people of Ukraine and the government of Ukraine. Over $60 million in crypto donations coming through on um, a cri crypto addresses controlled by the Ukrainian government, which is absolutely insane. They're actually uh, talking about releasing NFTs as well. Alex talks about all of these things. Uh, and this legislation that just went forward to uh, approve crypto, you know, a, a set of laws basically to make Ukraine a crypto friendly jurisdiction. We get into that as well, but that's been a result of the conflict. And, uh, been as a result of Ukraine using crypto for real utility during a time of war. So David, any last thoughts before we get in? Yeah, I mean, there are a number of US congressmen, congresswomen and EU uh, political leaders who I know listen to Bankless. So I would just like to say that as soon as Ukraine uh, was faced with the opportunity to use crypto, they started adopting crypto friendly regulation. So I think this is perhaps going to be uh, a, a lesson a lesson to learn, a lesson to pay attention to, that crypto helps entire countries when they need it. Guys, we're going to get right into the episode with Alex. But before we do, we want to tell you about the sponsors that made this episode possible. So, you've got some money, but how are you going to use it? You want to spend. You, me, shopping, now, bro. When you know you should be saving. You'll never buy a house at this rate. But what if you could spend and save at the same time? For the enlightened kind, with inquiring minds, a new world awaits. Set yourself free with completely flexible, self-repaying loan technology. Supported on desktop and mobile, seize the power of Alchemix, allowing you to spend and save at the same time. Leverage your wealth without risk of liquidation. Take out a loan that repays itself. By using yield from your deposit to pay off your balance, your only debt is time. What was once inconceivable 
is now within your grasp. You're winning some. Bankless is proud to be sponsored by Uniswap. Uniswap is a new paradigm in asset exchange infrastructure. Instead of a cumbersome order book system where trades are matched with other humans, Uniswap is an autonomous piece of software on Ethereum that lets you trade any token at the current market price. No human counterparties or centralized intermediaries, just autonomous code on Ethereum. Input the token you want to sell and receive the token you want to buy. The Uniswap Grants program is accepting applications for grants. Do you have something of value that you think you want to contribute to the Uniswap ecosystem? No matter how big or small your idea is, you can apply for a uni grant at uniswapgrants.org and help steer Uniswap in the direction that you think it should go. Thank you, Uniswap, for sponsoring Bankless. The Layer 2 era is upon us. Ethereum's Layer 2 ecosystem is growing every day, and we need L2 bridges to be fast and efficient in order to live a Layer 2 life. Across is the fastest and cheapest and most secure cross-chain bridge. With Across, you don't have to worry about the long wait times or high fees to get your assets back to the Layer 1. Assets are bridged and available for use almost instantaneously. Across's bridges are powered by UMA's optimistic Oracle to securely transfer tokens from Layer 2 back to Ethereum. Across is critical ecosystem infrastructure and ownership is being handed over to the community. You can be a part of this story of Across by joining the Discord and becoming a co-founder and helping to design the Fair Fair launch of Across. If you want to bridge your assets quickly and securely, go to across.to to bridge your assets between ETH, Optimism, Arbitrum, or Boba Networks. Bankless Nation, I want to introduce you to our next guest, uh, Alex Bornyakov. He is the Deputy Minister of Digital Transformation of Ukraine. We're going to be talking about Ukraine's recent embrace of crypto in the midst of war. Uh, Alex, uh, we have never actually recorded with an episode with someone who's in the middle of war. So can we start with, can you just tell us, how are you doing? How is Ukraine doing? Um, well, I'm fine. And of course, uh, uh, that's, our, that's what's going on is really terrible and horrible. Um, so far, almost half of the territory, well, less, maybe like 40% of the Ukrainian territory uh, being under different uh, um, difficult times, um, so in some in some part of Ukraine there is an actual war zone. Some part just uh, experiencing shortage in everything. Is in some cities there is no heat and electricity, um, and a lot of cities being shelled. Even Kiev. Uh, so when it's all started, I was in Kiev and I spent two day, almost two days. And I woke up from from explosions, uh, and there was, and then during the next twenty four hours, there was instant like sirens going, and you had to go to shelter. So, but there was light, there was connection, uh, and it's still there, um, but uh, it's not safe on around forty percent of Ukrainian territory. So, but even in a, in a distant part, they 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 they, they fire ballistic rockets uh, to, as they say, to destroy military infrastructure. But sometimes it's just missing and and, and um, people dying. So, well, that's that's terrible. And but we're holding up. Uh, we're trying to make our be our best. We do our best to. Uh, keep going to do our job and everyone uh, has to do its job because we believe we're going to win and we need to restore this and there's so much work ahead of us but thank you and we really appreciate you uh, a lot of people from from us from canada from U european union from other countries are standing with us and that's really inspiring for all the ukrainians uh, that uh, a lot of countries support us in this difficult times. Alex, that's definitely something that I've noticed both inside of Ukraine and outside of Ukraine is there seems to be an immense amount of unity going on. And at least from the outside perspective, at least initially in the first few weeks of the war, well, we saw just a, a surprising amount of high morale out of Ukraine. Uh, but I'm wondering how that's been holding up now that we're beyond 15 days into this thing. How's the morale on 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 the ground at Ukraine? It, 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 I like short answer is uh, what what I personally experience is pretty much high. The morale is 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 beyond I think anyone's expectations. Um, 
people in Ukraine are really united. And uh, um, according to the latest poll that I that I'm aware of, uh, 92 percent, even 92 percent of Ukrainians believe that we're going to win this war. And during the first 96 hours is really hectic and it is news was were horrible because they were advancing and uh, it was just so many people were afraid of uh, what's going on, what's going to happen and, and they were fleeing country um, in, in Russia. But now it's a kind of stabilized. Um, our military forces uh, um, stopped them on almost on all directions and pushed back on several uh, directions, especially around Kiev, which is kind of like a heart of Ukraine and it's located in, in, in the middle of the country. Um, so uh, now I see like we can kind of uh, plan at least short term and maybe mid term. But during the first week, it was not possible because like a situation was changing uh, dramatically every couple hours and uh, and uh, people were really, really upset but now i think morale is high but we experience like the the war is in our, in our country it, it came to our homes and it's and like if, if for russians and for the rest of the world maybe just news but uh for ukrainians it's just, it, it's losing their you losing your friends you losing you, you hear like people you know Losing their uh, properties uh, and uh, and they worry about their relatives. They lo they're losing connection with their relatives in in a war zone. So it's 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 a it's a it's a tragedy. Uh, it's a huge tragedy. So, but generally, we we have high hopes. Well, of course, Alex, our, our hearts go out to everyone that's been affected by this. It's obviously the last thing that everyone wants to see happen to the world. Uh, Alex, we were introduced by uh, Vitalik Buterin, and uh, because of your, your role in the Ukrainian government, you are the, the Deputy Minister of Digital Transformation. What's, what does that mean? What does your, your job entail? What, what are your goals as Deputy Minister of Digital Transform Transformation? Well, sure. Um, the Ministry of Digital Transformation were, was created not so long ago. It was like we are two, two years plus a couple months old. So there was, there was a, a couple major goals that were set up uh, like we have envisioned and uh, one of them uh, is to develop and uh, grow the IT industry of Ukraine so I'm basically I'm like a, as a deputy minister I'm in charge of uh, growth and development of uh, IT industry and of course IT industry uh, in, in involves crypto and with this significant we believe that is a significant part of it so once uh, right after I started we immediately um, announced that we want to become crypto-friendly jurisdiction and we want to do uh, what we can in order to uh, uh, make uh, crypto and all the virtual assets legal in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, like generally speaking, as a deputy minister, uh, uh, I was uh, I was in charge of a couple of projects like what we built a project called DSCD. It's a sort of like a Silicon Valley for IT companies with low taxes, with other a lot of other benefits. Um, we were introducing electronic residency for those who want to do business in Ukraine but don't want to go into your uh, country physically, um, and uh, and many many more uh, initiate much more initiatives that we were doing. Um, so. Um, I hope I give you a sense of uh, what I'm, what I was doing before the war, and of course it's dramatically changed after the war. Yeah, uh, Alex, I, I want to get a perspective of uh, what cr crypto in Ukraine was like before these events have unfolded. Uh, from from our perspective, there's been a number of projects uh, that that Ryan and I pay attention to that have sent out messages saying hey, progress is going to be a little bit slow due to the number of developers that are in the middle of fighting a war at the moment. And so there's a lot of developers that, that we have connections to that are in Ukraine and have had to uh, just, you know, pause whatever they're working on in the, in the crypto space. And so for, there's a, Ukraine hosts a disproportionate amount of crypto developers, but also what was the attitude of like the Ukraine government, the centralized Ukraine government about crypto prior to this? Like w was crypto on the radar? Cause it's certainly on the radar now, 
What was what was the attitude about crypto before these events have unfolded? Well, of course, uh, most of the government was pretty much skeptic about crypto, and uh, you, you have no idea how how much efforts that did it cost to convince people to uh, make them believe that it's it's going to turn to something bigger. So um, when I when I started to do this, uh, Bitcoin cost was around three. 3500s so it is just on the low and everyone's like why are we even dealing with it but then um but of course we believe in crypto and as a minister of digital transformation we define policy of the government regarding specific um, um items or uh directions i would i would call this and uh uh, if we speak that crypto is a priority, it also becomes a part of government priority. So in the, each ministry, ministry gives its priority, so it becomes like generally like um, government priority. So it was put in government priorities, but then uh, you have to convince National Bank of Ukraine, Ministry of Finance, uh, uh, Security Commission, uh, Financial Monitoring Services. So there's a lot of authorities that um related to crypto and of course if you even you consider crypto is priority they don't so you have to convince them uh, and uh, then crypto went to like rocketed to 60,000 per uh, <laughs> bitcoin price and and it was um, and of course uh, um this was another uh, uh, like, uh, portion of attention from them they, they said like all right, all right so let's let's uh, let's do it faster so eventually we managed to um, uh, vote their law on virtual assets, which basically about crypto and uh, pass it through Paul Polyman. Um, but then uh, war hit us. But the good news is that once we started this crypto fund uh, and everyone saw that how, how successful it was and, and it is, it, how successful it is right now, uh, President Zelensky signed, eventually signed this law and we are working on taxation legislation and other um, uh, official papers that we have to do before this all goes live. And and now um, no one actually argues about that that crypto is uh, uh, is not priority. So I think everyone understands how it works now. So that's that's the good news. Alex, it's funny that much of the before that you just described, um, I think, fits a lot of jurisdictions across the world, a lot of countries across the world, where it's hard for any sort of digital transformation group internal to the government to actually get government officials and the rest of the government uh, to, to talk about crypto. It's hard to get it on their radar. And sometimes when they do, the, these governments are, are hostile. But what you're describing is, you know, first of all, there, there was these champions internally to, to Ukraine, like yourself, who are sort of pushing this, this pro-crypto agenda forward. Um, but can you tell people, bankless listeners who haven't uh, been maybe haven't seen what's gone on, you, you mentioned a crypto fund for Ukraine. Uh, what is that and how much money has Ukraine actually raised in crypto so far? Because it seems like that has completely changed the tone and tenor of the conversation about crypto's utility in Ukraine. So tell us about this fund and what's been raised. Yeah. So again, during the first uh, day of the war, um, our national bank's severely limited ability to send foreign transfers, especially in dollar in euro. So uh, we have to somehow um, find a solution to cover immediate needs for armed force of Ukraine. And, um, and, and that was, uh, this was one of the decision of like, of Mikhail Fedorov. He said like, listen, we need, let's set up a fund and do this with their, uh, private exchange, um, uh, and uh, make it, uh, so we can, uh, push it and, and uh, tell everyone that we also accept the nations in, in, in crypto. And, um, we and and then when money started to flow in, uh, we were able to quickly perform the transactions, and and maybe for the first days, uh, the crypto was our first choice for that, and so crypto really helped us because we were able to cover those needs, and um, um, so far it managed. We managed to uh, cover uh, together like sixty-two million dollars around that. Um, 
And um, but again, as as the war has continued, we have uh, refined an approach, and we launched the official website or where people can uh, donate the cryptocurrencies and, and different tokens. So we started from Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Tether, but then we started to add uh, a lot of others. Uh, so uh, and we so much appreciated for like. Gavin Wood responded with five million dollar donation through Polkadot. Then um, Dara uh, also donated like million dollars in HBAR. Uh, we also connected uh, Dogecoin, Monero, Icon, Cusper, Solana. Solana community was very helpful, and Everstake. So uh, we were like uh, more than this was beyond expectations that uh, that com crypto community. Is so into it, so they 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 eager to help, and of course uh, this step that we have taken. So we announced that we able to get officially a donation in crypto. It it, it reflected in, in in their mind, and they decided to help. So this is this is that's where absolutely. It's absolutely incredible, and we're going to um, provide some more information on that fund and where where the crypto community can can actually continue to donate. Because I assume, Alex, you guys are continuing to accept funds. Yes, uh, yes, yes. As we go, and over sixty million dollars. Then is this all coming from individuals and organizations in the crypto community? Is this where this money's coming from? Um, well, I mentioned some or organizations who were donated, but um, the majority of the funds, I think, coming from from individuals and. Um, uh we we actually haven't analyzed uh who exactly donated uh and uh, where this money comes for, uh, coming from well uh quite fair, uh, to be quite fair um we need to understand it's just, it, it's it's, it's uh, pretty hard to find out uh <laughs> yes the most of uh, the nations where they come from yeah, so um, the, I think part of the reason the crypto community has uh, rallied around this is because crypto is, is definitely a, a movement for freedom and sovereignty. And I think many in the crypto community see what, you, what you're doing, uh, your resistance in Ukraine as, as part and parcel with that. But can I ask you, Alex, what has Ukraine done so far with the funds? Uh, have you done anything with it or what are they allocated to, um, to, to go uh, fund? Well, uh, before I um, answer the sorry question, I, I'd like to mention also this is very, uh, I think that's very important to the community that um, FTX uh, managed to establish relationship with the National Bank of Ukraine, and they actually created a bridge to convert crypto into fiat currencies with the help of National Bank of Ukraine. And so Everstake uh, helped to facilitate this and FTX and uh, National Bank. This is the, like, this is the, uh, this is a precedent because that it's not, never happened before, and uh, I I know there it's it's outside of our fund, but I just want to mention that as as example of uh, integration of the government structures and uh, and, and uh, private crypto private institutions like international uh, how they communicate how they cooperate with each other, and uh, I hope this is going to be or again a precedent precedent for. Uh, for other things with, that crypto companies can do with the government um, about uh, the fund itself. So, so far we we have spent uh, around 35, 36, 36, close to $36 million. And uh, uh, we purchased thousands of uh, bulletproof vests, helmets, uh, and, uh, medicines, uh, pa medicine packages, uh, um, we purchased a couple hundred thousands of uh, uh, food rations for uh, for Ukrainian militaries, uh, thousands of uh, thermal um, imagers, optics, night vision goggles. Uh, so this all goes to to the army, to uh, to our defenders. So uh, we're gonna. By the way, we're gonna provide with their more statistics and 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 um, reports on what being purchased. And um, uh, for, for instance, like HBAR, they told we want to uh, support just humanitarian needs. So we bought just, uh, uh, what's this called? Like, uh, mobile um, uh, aid packages. Uh, I mean, if you're injured in the battlefield, then you can quickly uh, fix your 
Uh, so that's so we, we respond to every request, actually. Alex, you mentioned that the uh, traditional banking system st uh, stopped being so useful at the onset of the war. How has access to these crypto funds uh, uh, enabled Ukraine to access resources when the banking system uh, stopped working so well? Like, what about the properties of crypto, the, the instant finality, the instant settlement, instant transfers, and also global transfers? How have these properties really enabled crypto or really enabled Ukraine to achieve some of its goals? Well, if I understand your question correctly, uh, I'll try to answer, but you correct me if I, if I go to the mm -hmm. wrong direction. Um, so, um, again, during the first day of war, we had to um, uh, put a hold on on number of um, purchases because we we had to um just like put that let's really put a halt because we need to deliver them we need to um make all the paperwork but we don't have time for that so we were using crypto to pay uh pay those money like a prepaid um but then uh companies started to respond and it's like listen we can even do in crypto some of the companies started to especially U.S. companies, they started like, all right, we can do Coinbase account for, for, uh, for the company and you can send a crypto, then we can just uh, convert it. That's, that's just forget it. We know how, how well you are and uh, you, you just transfer crypto. You don't need to find like uh, 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 exchange to fiat currencies. Um, and I think that we like 40% of uh, transfer were just straight in crypto. Uh, and of course, um, having this tool um, and comparing with the fiat currencies where you send a wire, wire and then you wait for day or two and you're not able to even check your transaction and other party uh, need to uh, confirm with his bank or their bank to respond to, yeah, we got the payment. But in, with crypto, you just get in five minutes a proof of transaction because you, you go to the either scan, uh, you give them link and, and, and they assure that they make they make sure that they you send them and it's, that's okay. They, they just confirm the transaction is done. So it's it's completely different from from wires and uh, other means of payment. Yeah, people tend to think that crypto is overly complicated, and that's what well, that's what scares them about crypto. But it seems to be that when it really comes down to it, the crypto is actually the more simple of the two. Uh, types of uh, financial systems that we have. And you've said that some vendors have, have told you that they're willing to accept crypto. Uh, how, how proliferated, how, how prolific is that? Like, is, are, are most vendors able to accept crypto in, in, in this time? No, no. Um, okay. Uh, well, especially for, for those who are dealing with their uh, military-grade equipment and, uh, and, or equipment just for, for the military, uh, they are more like... Uh, classic companies that prefer to do all the old fashioned way. Um, but still, um, they started to accept at least prepaid and they say like, listen, give us prepaid and then we can figure out so we can, uh, so we can, we know that you're, um, um, have serious intentions. Um, um, I mentioned that, but I think maybe it's missed, uh, like maybe 40% of, uh, of what we spend is actual crypto and, and the 60, it's it's rough calculation. I'm, I don't have the exact figures at this in, in top of my head, but uh, majority of the payments, of course, has to be done through wire because again, we we're not dealing with the regular stuff. You, 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 I hope you understand that that if we were dealing with the I don't know some uh, standard goods for I don't know, for people and entertainment or whatever, I think there will percentage will be more, but but still, it's 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 pretty good. I think. Polygon is Ethereum's largest and most vibrant scaling solution to date. With millions of monthly users and all of the biggest DeFi apps, the Polygon ecosystem has turned into a blossoming metropolis of DeFi activity. Transactions on Polygon are quick and cheap, allowing users the freedom to achieve their DeFi goals, all while being economically anchored to Ethereum. But Polygon isn't just the proof of stake sidechain. The Polygon team is building a suite of scaling solutions, including Polygon Hermes, Maiden, Nightfall, and Zero, all with different design choices in order to be optimized for all possible crypto use cases. If you're a developer who wants to build on the Polygon ecosystem, go to the link in the show notes to check out their fantastic documentation. And if you're a user who just wants to experience fast and cheap DeFi, you can bridge over your ETH or other tokens and start playing around with any of the thousands of applications that are available on Polygon.
If you're going bankless, you need MetaMask. This is your tool to unlock the world of DeFi without giving up custody over your private keys. MetaMask is both a secure in-browser wallet and also a secure bridge for your hardware wallet. You can now trade tokens on any DEX or aggregator. MetaMask Swap gathers real-time pricing information across all the DeFi exchanges, allowing you to select your best price while getting all the MetaMask benefits of self-custody, lower gas costs, and increased transaction success rates. MetaMask also has a fantastic mobile wallet that I use when I'm out and about which I use to collect PO apps, NFTs, and do all my DeFi things while I'm away from home. If you haven't downloaded MetaMask, you gotta try it out. Web3 wouldn't be the same without it. Download MetaMask for desktop and mobile at metamask.io and load up your Trezor, Ledger, Lattice, or Keystone hardware wallets so that they too can get into the world of Web3. Living a bankless life requires taking control over your own private keys. And that's why so many in the bankless nation already have their Ledger hardware wallet. And brand new to the Ledger lineup of hardware wallets is the Ledger Nano S Plus, a huge upgrade to the world's most popular hardware wallet. With more memory and a larger screen, the Nano S Plus makes it easy to navigate and verify your transactions. And the paired Ledger Live desktop app gives you increased transparency as to what is about to happen with your NFT. What you see is what you sign. The Nano S Plus gives you the smoothest possible user experience while you're doing all of your crypto things. So go to the Ledger website to check out the features of the new Ledger Nano S Plus and join the waitlist to get yours. And don't forget about the Crypto Life card, also powered by Ledger. The CL card is a crypto debit card that hooks right into the Ledger Live app, right next to all the DeFi apps and services that you're already used to doing, like swapping tokens and staking. So if you don't have a Ledger hardware wallet, go to ledger.com, grab a Ledger, and take control over your crypto. So with this uh, 60 million in crypto donations, how when you just zoom out, how would you say that the crypt, crypto's involvement in Ukraine has changed the course of the war? Well, I don't have... <laughs> I'm afraid I can't answer your question because uh, sure. on on uh, on my level, I understand that those thousand of uh, of the goods that we uh, purchase and, and and now we're delivering. Um, and, and by the way, it takes time. Um, I I I can't say that all of them already on the battlefield. But uh, what I assume that if we supply those goods, it, some of them can save people lives. Uh, and in this case, um, let's hope that this bulletproof vest never will be needed. But uh, again, we know that if we uh, uh, arm, we uh, not arm, but if we supply those uh, those goods to the soldiers, uh, they could feel more safe. And uh, and that this is that this is our goal to save as much life as we can. Alex, you mentioned about how there's been uh, integration with crypto exchanges like FTX and how they've helped bridge the gap between some of the crypto assets and, and fiat. Can you just el elaborate on that a little bit more? Is it like um, uh, the Ukraine government sends crypto to one of the exchanges and the exchanges takes it the rest of the way to a fiat transfer? Is that is that how this infrastructure has been set up? Well, I think it's opposite. So there was a oh, okay. uh, yeah. So official um, National Bank of Ukraine created um, a special account for the nations, but of course it was in fiat. And um, at some point there was some uh, people who wanted to donate, uh, and uh, I, I think it was Everstake, but they were not able to transfer. So they involved uh, FTX. So they signed a contract or some sort of agreement that. Um, once a crypto hit or FTX account, they able to transfer it. And uh, so our national bank going to get a dollar, U.S. dollar. Mm. And how would you say, are there any stories about uh, individual Ukrainians using crypto that you've heard? Is there any like experiences that you've heard in the last like, you know, three weeks about how crypto is, uh, how individual Ukrainians are, are using crypto? Uh, well, <laughs> Yeah, that's the that's a sad story. But three million people left Ukraine. There are three million refugees, and uh, I know that I, I know some individual stories where people from uh, from like families from Ukraine were separated. So men stayed here, and the rest of the family fled to Poland to other countries. So they were. Um, Sending them crypto because they they do so much rush and, and they didn't have any money, so crypto became a sort of a um, easy way to uh, help your family in being a refugee in another country and feel safe again and feel comfortable.
So I, I, I know the, of, of such stories. Uh, I believe there are much more stories about the like, business that, again, dealing with the uh, distant part of I inside a country. So they send crypto because uh, banks are put some limits and, and they can exchange it. I know of some such some stories about that, but it's not um, uh, it's not many of them. But yeah, there's still a couple. Alex, do you think do you think that is kind of the the role of crypto here? I'm wondering, like, because you have a, a unique perspective on crypto, given everything you've gone through recently. Um, is 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 crypto a technology and like a money system that um, is here for the world and for the people and for governments? when the banking system fails? Is that its role? What do you see as the main value proposition of crypto? Well, I I, I don't think at this point uh, it could really substitute banking system, but it, it it's, it's definitely um, an option. And uh, um, I, I believe that uh, Again, after some time, in, 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 maybe even in the close future, we're going to see more examples of, uh, of um, companies or even countries who are um, moving from this, I don't know, what we get used to, the banking system to, um, to crypto, crypto. I think there's some parts are missing in terms of crypto. And... Uh, um, David mentioned that it's, there was a lot of uh, assumptions on complications with crypto, and there are really uh, and there's some um, in, in the beginning. So uh, um, I think that uh, the wor like what the world introduced decades ago with the, with the banking cards is just a like concept of having uh, a card. Then you don't need don't need to log in anywhere. You didn't have to study anything. Anything um, uh, made this uh, mass adoption. There was a way to mass adoption. So I think there right now, uh, crypto community and and, uh, and the companies that build uh, perfect tools like exchanges uh, and uh, um, companies that uh, operate on blockchain. Uh, and, and they built a uh, pretty much solid concept of how it's going to work. What is missing from my standpoint is, is easy entrance. And once this, the way for easy entrance will be found, believe, I, I personally, I believe there's going to be a bright future for crypto. Um, I'm curious about this dependency because um, crypto, of course, is dependent on a, a country having uh, electricity grid, a power grid up, and it's also dependent on uh, internet reliability. And obviously, in in the conflict right now, I'm not sure how certain those things are uh, for the people of Ukraine. And yet, um, the banking system, now that it's moved to digital and electronic, is also dependent on those two things as well. Uh, I'm I'm curious. A lot of people who criticize crypto sort of say things like, "Well, but what happens when the internet goes down?" Um, what is the internet reliability like in Ukraine right now? And is this a, is this a concern for the financial system at large and also for, you know, the digital transformation, the, cri the crypto initiatives that you guys are pursuing? Uh, I think, uh, people should realize eventually that today's banking system, not, not able to work without electricity grid as well. That's maybe that's a hard truth that everyone has to, has to learn, but I don't know how to send a wire transfer without, uh, because it's built, built in a Swift message system and Swift message system uh, servers. And, 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 and again, it's a sort of a ledger. It, it, it's, it's maybe it's far from blockchain, but, but it's, it's, again, it's a ledger. And um, that's, their, that's the first, that's my observation and my conclusion on that. But about uh, Ukrainian communication system, what, um, uh, apparently, one of the major tasks of the ministry we are worked for um, uh, was improving digital, um, improving communication infrastructure of Ukraine. For the last two years, we were working on uh, better cell reception, on delivering high-speed broadband internet to every corner of Ukraine. Eventually, uh, we supposed to cover 95% of the territory with a 
great internet. So this was one of the goals, and uh, and we were moving towards it. So um, Ukraine is um, um, internet in Ukraine pretty much cheap, especially relatively to U.S. So in uh, in Ukraine, you, you can have like great internet connection speed for ten twenty dollars a month. So um, and and it's it was everywhere. Um, so like 4G, we were we were moving slowly slowly from 3G for to 4G, but then uh, we obtained uh, new frequencies from the military and the speed the, the speed of uh, uh, switching of new standard was tremendous. So for last year we completely moved to 4G um, in, in the country and even started testing 5G. It was it was attempted, uh, but in the ministry. There's another person in charge, but we're, it's another deputy of, uh, de deputy minister who's in charge of communication, Alexander Shellis. But, um, again, so this was a tax task of the ministry. And, um, and right now, um, it appears that, um, we did good because in the most, uh, uh, territory of Ukraine, internet's still working and, and the connection is fine. Alex, one of the things I've talked uh, to Ryan about with these crypto donations is that um, typically humanitarian aid from foreign countries can only be spent on on certain things, uh, and you know usually just like you know food and and medical supplies. But when it comes to crypto, you know th this can actually be spent on the like, bulletproof vests that soldiers would would wear, and that's definitely something new on this on this world that we've never seen before. We've never seen the interaction of permissionless crypto payments and and war and buying resources. And I'm wondering if uh, there's been any conversations from inside Ukraine about this or any sort of like uh, I just one thing I'm, I'm interested in is in when we're looking at. Um, uh, externally from like pr the perspectives of the United States or the EU, they're watching uh, Ukraine not have to actually follow the typical humanitarian limitations on donated funds. I I'm wondering if there's any conversation that's being had in, in the Ukrainian government about this this particular aspect. That's, uh, that's a very relevant question. Um, but you have to understand what's the mood in Ukraine at, at, at this moment. Like, uh, imagine uh, if your home being invaded and you were already on the second floor hiding from uh, I don't know people who is who have um, are armed and they're looking for you. And in this situation, I think you're you, you want to take any measure and you, you're going to use any means to protect you. So mm -hmm. um, I think that's of course it's unprecedented. But, and and in, in in a peaceful time, it was just no one's going to allow this. But uh, we are we were in a desperate position. Right now, it's like more stable, it, it, more controlled. But for, during the first day of war, we were afraid that we're going to lose our country in in three days. So why you need this bureaucracy if you might lose the whole country and and, and lose everything, like everyone. Will flee, and that's that's uh, and of course we we not we were not thinking about this part. We were thinking how to survive, and this pushed us to any means to help us to protect ourselves. Um, today, of course, uh, it's a bit different, and uh, and uh, but but still, it's already like it's a reality. And and again, president signed the law, so it's it's totally legal in Ukraine, so we can use this. Um, yeah, according to the law, crypto cannot be pay a means of payment. But again, um, we uh, also want to be complete. Like for the rest of the world, that's fine. And and if as long as it's it's fine for the rest of the world, it's it's fine for Ukraine. And it's uh, and once the war all over, I think we uh, we will reconsider the approach. But mm -hmm. we in this reality. Certainly. Yeah, you, you touched on the, the new crypto policy law that got signed into, into place. Let's talk about that a, a little bit more. Just the, the, the question is, how has these events changed Ukraine's stance towards crypto? And the answer, I think, is, is generally pretty, uh, pretty positively. Can you go into the details about the law that was passed and kind of what that means with the relationship between Ukraine and crypto moving forward? Um, well, first of all, um it's the first time in the history of Ukraine where we put 
what exactly is crypto? Uh, how we should treat it from uh, from civil relations relationship standpoint? How government treat it? Also, we define who are professional uh, service providers, which is VASPs, right? So what kind of uh, AML procedures has to be taken by those who companies who um, want to be licensed uh, as, as VSPs? Uh, there are many more aspects uh, that this law covers, uh, including uh, KYC of, uh, of the companies, KYC of the customers, how this should be done, how to protect investors, how you should uh, um, mint tokens, uh, and uh, what kind of tokens could be, there's no, I'm sorry, uh, it's just about minting. It, it, we don't specify what kind of, uh, um, like what what exactly, like what, what kind of crypto exactly is legal or not legal. So there's no, um, in, in this law, we don't say like, like Bitcoin is, is uh, we don't mention Bitcoin, we don't mention any cryptos, we just define the, uh, the broad, uh, it's in a broad range of, uh, so we say, that, listen, this is possible. This is a, those are virtual assets and we should treat them like this. Also, uh, this law uh, defines how we can, for example, uh, inherit it or how we can uh, sell it or how we can exchange between physical persons because this become becomes an asset. It became an asset. So once it became an asset, then... Uh, Government basically defined the basic rules of uh, how it should be uh, treated inside a country and, of course, outside a country. Alex, do you think it would have happened uh, without this this crisis? I know the the legislation was put forward. I believe in the past it was um, kind of vetoed by um, Zelensky previously, and I I think maybe the reason was there were other priorities, of course. But now it it seems to have been um, accepted. Uh, maybe as a result of this crisis, or do you think it would have happened as quickly independent of the conflict that you're now in? It would have happened, but um, at much slower pace. So I think we would have spent another, I don't know, year or so, but now it's much, much faster. Um, do you have any advice on the back of this for other countries who are, you know, and advocates, digital transformation leaders in their respective governments on what it takes to like help put something like this together and to push it through and to promote it? Any any lessons learned along the way? Um, yeah, well, my advice will start from what we realized in Ukraine at some point. Uh, we realized that there's a huge blockchain community. There are a lot of people that are using crypto and you can't ignore it. I mean, you can, but uh, it's gonna be like a black market. Anyway, because people want to use it. So if you're a true leader of your country, if you're, if you're really um, take care of your people, want to take care of people, um, make it official. Give them right to possess crypto. Give them right to pass it to others, to conduct a business with crypto, to, to create companies, because they want to do that. And they will anyway. Will do that. They they they'll find they'll find a way. So that's probably the advice. So don't uh, deny, but rather allow. Yeah, you can allow on on your terms because you're a government, and you can say, listen, all right, you can do this under specific circumstances with their under our strict supervision, but. Uh, I'm, I, I don't think it's it's right to just deny the fact that crypto is being used by most majority of the countries in the world so far. So this is this is absurd. Alex, one thing that's been interesting is we've observed uh, all of this play out in our respective governments and jurisdictions. At least one conversation in the in the U.S. is how um, effective, um, relatively effective sanctions have been in uh, the the conflict so far. And some lawmakers in the U.S. are saying, well, if we move to a world of crypto, then these sanctions would be less effective in the future because, of course, it's much harder to, you can, you know, it's easier to block the SWIFT system for the EU and the U.S. And it's very difficult by design for uh, sanctions to go into effect across crypto. Do you see that as a downside of crypto for, from your perspective, like relinquishing the power to block sanctions? I mean, I can completely see 
the alternative in, in Ukraine, of course, you're, you're saying, hey, you know, we could create a, a fund and get donations from all over the world when the banking system wasn't working very well and it's instant money. On the other hand, some of the sanctions that have been put into place wouldn't have been effective in such a system. What is What are your thoughts on that argument? Well, I, I, I think that the purpose of uh, uh, crypto and, uh, and the fiat currency is not about sanctions. It, it's just one case of, of such things. And, and, and they want to control, not because only of sanctions, but they generally want to, I don't know, supervise the financial system of many reasons, not because they want to just suppress someone, but, but also there, there's a, uh, there are many tasks for the government that they have to do because, uh, because we want to feel safe too. Uh, I, um, I, I respect uh, my government, I respect the US government, and when they say, listen, we have to be careful, I, rather, I would rather listen. Because I remember the mass uh, during the uh, um, depression in in the United States almost 100 years ago. Then it was financial crisis. So those are examples of what could 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 be if if government just uh, sleep out everything from their hands. Uh, so I think that well, it's a really hard question. It, it's a great question, but it's it's really hard to me to say that. Well, uh, let's stay with the current system. And, and, uh, but in the same time, I, I also see potential in crypto. And I, I think that that's, that could be a corporation. That could be a uh, win-win situation when uh, we still can use, or we can move to crypto. But whether, again, uh, under certain circumstances, when we say, when we basically uh, acknowledge that uh, there should be some um, fail safes. The fails, fail safes. Yeah, Alex, what do you have as a call to action for all the bankless listeners out there? We can we will obviously put the link uh, of, of the donation page into the show notes. So maybe a call to action is to go donate crypto to Ukraine. Uh, but also, what do you want the bankless listeners to know, and what do you want the bankless listeners to do? Uh well, of course, uh, we appreciate if you put this link, and we encourage people to donate. Uh, we uh, we still have a lot of needs, uh, and we're thankful to everyone who's going to do that. Um, um, I don't know to, to listeners of the bankless. Uh, I think we I would, my message would be that we all doing uh, something that never was done before. So we should be proud that uh, we bring together as a community at some point, at some day in the future, uh, everyone's going to be dealing with it and saying, like, listen, there, there was a lot of uh, evolution in this. And, and we know that uh, those people were, were in the beginning of, of, uh, <laughs> of, of such a great things, uh, things that we use today uh, as a common thing. Alex, uh, in in addition to the sixty over sixty million dollars of donations that have come from the crypto community, uh, some NFTs have gotten donated as well to the to the Ukraine address, including a CryptoPunk. I was wondering if there's an official policy as to what Ukraine is going to do with that CryptoPunk. We now working on a separate uh, section on the, on our website donate.digital.gov.ua. So they're going to be separate section. The section called NFT. So we're going to list all the NFTs that was donated for the whole time. And uh, we'll probably go for the auction. Uh, NFTs are not priority at this point. We still have uh, money to distribute from from um, other cryptocurrencies. But I think once we uh, see what we have and, and, and show this to the community and start auction, those money will be... Uh, Directed to the to the fund. Well, I would imagine that the NFTs auctioned off by the country of Ukraine might fetch a nice premium <laughs> for just the token value of that. So that's going to be pretty interesting to watch. Uh, Alex, there was a, at one point talk of um, Ukraine doing a token as well itself. Is that still on the table, or is that uh, not happening? Um, it depends on if, if we if we, talk, if we talk about NFT. Yeah, we have a project. Uh, which couldn't be like a museum of war. We we want to call it never again. 
and it's going to be our um, uh, piece of uh, it's going to be NFTs is a uh, containing piece of art and some specific event event connected to the, to the every day of war. So uh, from the day zero to the day of the war, we're going to put uh, we're going to create NFT connected to this same to this same day. And every day going to have a unique NFT. Mm. So people who will see this collection will be able to observe uh, how the war was uh, going forward till the end. And uh, th this is the project that we're working on together with, again, with a private partnership. It's, it's public private partnership. Um, but we never intended to uh, create some cryptocurrency um but in the same time we're working with our national bank uh working on cbdc so it, it's going to be at some point it's going to be uh, electronic hryvnia uh, under national bank of ukraine and they're going to issue tokens of course but it's it's going to be oh, cbdc that, that that is fascinating and um alex i really appreciate you spending we really appreciate the crypto community the bankless community appreciates you spending time with us uh, to tell us uh what's going on i know you've, you've got to be busy in all sorts of uh, various uh domains but i i could say on behalf of all of us that mm -hmm. not a day goes by that we're not thinking about the the people of Ukraine during this time. Uh, and we appreciate you spending some time with us today. Thanks a lot. Thank you, David. Thank you, Ryan. Cheers, Alex. Of course, guys, uh, risks and disclaimers. Of course, I don't think we have to get into, obviously, none of this was financial advice. Um, I, uh, I think we will include a link to a place to donate for uh, the Ukraine fund that we were talking about with Alex. So that is the action item from this episode is go check that out look at what they're doing, and uh, donate if you have the means and you have the funds. Thanks a lot. We appreciate you guys. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anything, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.